All right, well, with that, we'll, uh, we'll get rolling here. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Rumsey in our ongoing uh, Locked In series, continuing to be hosted by the Rumsey Specialist. My name is Sean Huber. I'm one of the Automation Systems Group Managers here at Rumsey. And today we're continuing the focus on the power side of our business with a presentation on industrial control components migration. Uh, I will say that there's a, a lot of information in this presentation that we'll be going through at uh, kind of a pretty brisk pace. Um, but if you do have any questions or anything that uh, gets a little bit more detailed, please reach out to the specialist that will be presenting here and, uh, and get that more detail. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce the Rumsey IC Safety and Sensor Specialists. You'll, you'll hear from all three of them here today, Donna Wyatt, Joe Lamonico, and Will Howley. Uh, all three of them cover Rumsey sales territory and all aspects of these products and have a combined of over 35 years of experience. I guess the one slide I will show here is just kind of a general agenda, just because we will be going through an awful lot of individual products. So, you know, kind of sensor stack lights, overloads, and down to some of the electronic circuit protection and safety stuff that you, you would see out in the field. So with that, I will uh, turn this over to, uh, to Donna. And I, I think, think I already have control. I think you have control. So go ahead, Donna, take over. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, and thanks for joining us. Um, I'll be going over sensors and signaling migration. So today I'll be talking about the 45 CPD, which is an analog and discrete output laser sensor, which will be obsolete this July. And that's uh, superseded by the 45 DMS and the 45 LMS, which are also analog and discrete laser measurement sensors. The 6000 series fiber optic sensors are going to be obsoleted this month. If anybody's using our 6000 series, which has to be at least 30 years old, I would urge you now to please uh, migrate to the 42AF or the 42EF sensors because uh, you don't want to get caught short on that because that whole family is very, very old. Um, the uh, 45F series of fiber optic amplifiers, the cabled models, will be obsolete in July, and those will be replaced by the brand new 46DFA small aperture fiber optic amplifier. And the 45 CLR color sensor will be migrating to the 46 CLR true color sensor. Okay. Um, the 45 CPD has been around a while. It's a good sensor, but it doesn't have I.O. link. And all of Rockwell's new sensors are coming equipped with I.O. link. So that sensor, depending on your application, will go to the 45 DMS and the 45 LMS. And you'll hear me say a lot about I.O. link, I.O. link. You don't have to hook a sensor up to I.O. link immediately. It is an off-the-shelf sensor, standard sensors that have standard wiring, but they have the I.O. link chip inside of them that if you decide to get, uh, you want more information from your sensors, you can easily just put it through an I.O. link module and connect it to your Logix controller and off you go. So that chip is already in there. Next slide, please. So the 45 DMS, oops, 45 DMS is a, uses a class one iSafe laser which is ideal for uh, precision distance measurements for ro roll diameter, material thickness, stack level. It's available for, with background suppression or background reflection sensing modes. The, uh, it has a five meter range on white paper and a three meter range on black paper. It's available with auto, NPN, PMP, and analog outputs. And what I mean by auto, NPN, PMP means uh, you don't have to worry about picking a sensor that's syncing or sourcing. This has both, and you don't have anything, dip switches to set or anything. Depending on how you have it wired, whether it be syncing or sourcing, the sensor will automatically tune itself to syncing or sourcing. And also, once again, if you're going to use I.O. link, you will not need an analog uh, PLC input card because it transfers the analog signal to a digital signal. 
its IP67 and IP69K ratings. 45 LMS sensor uses a class one or a class two laser depending on your operating range. If you're going to use the maximum 50 meters, it will be a class two laser, so you don't want to point it towards anybody's eyes. But you, you don't need any kind of eye protection, just so you know. It has one NPM, PMP discrete output and also an analog output. And it's available with retroreflective and diffuse sensing modes. It's good for material positioning, stack level, thickness measurement, roll diameter, distance measurement, and error proofing. The 42AF is a new high-powered right sight sensor. If anybody has heard of the 42EF sensor, they've been around a long time. They're still around. They're still the workhorse of the line. But the 42AF is more high-powered. It will You can use it along with the 42EF to replace your 6000 series, which is uh, shown there. The 42AF has a 30 millimeter nose mount and also an 18 millimeter base mount. It's IP67 and IP69K. The transmitted beam sensing range is 80 meters, and the polarized retroreflective range is 10 meters. It's also available in background suppression, background reflection, and through beam. And once again, it has that dual auto MPM PMP. But then if you're using an AC model, you can also select it with an output of single pole double throw electromechanical relay. The 46 DFA is a DIN rail fiber optic amplifier. It has uh, programmable response times. Uh, uh, the uh, 50 microseconds is the default, but you can also uh, stretch out your response time. It has a teachable LED intensity, which helps you with uh, clear or transparent objects, has a built-in totalizer, a built-in low margin alarm, and has good crosstalk and noise immunity. It's ideal for limited space applications, detecting small objects and clear materials. The 45 CLR um, is migrating to the 46 CLR. Now, no um, obsolescence date has been listed so far, but if you are using the older technology 45 CLR, you might want to convert to the 46 CLR. Um, the 46 CLR has uh, longer ranges. It's easily to set up the colors, and it also is IO link. Okay. The, 40, oh, the 46 CLR has a true red, green, blue color value, and it also you can adjust the intensity when you use an IO link. It has distance correction. Uh, for consistent color detection, has an inter internal storage up to seven colors when you're in a color match mode, which you probably will be. And you can store unlimited colors if you're using I.O. link via your uh, Logix controller. It has a nice large LCD display. There's nine adjustable tolerance levels. And it has three discrete outputs. And it's IP67 and IP69 and it's a zinc cast enclosure. This is just a snapshot of the three um, versions that are available on the 46 CLR. Um, it uses a white LED, and you'll see here where it has the uh, glare suppression, small spot size, or the long range, which goes up to 150 millimeters. Just as an IO link refresher, um, uh, you know, as I said before, it's a standard sensor, off the shelf, standard wiring. So it has a simplified design and it's easy to install. It has real time diagnostics for sensor health. So if you have a signal strength issue, um, it's measured. It might be because of a dirty lens or a misalignment. So it gives you a warning that there's a, you know, a dirty lens involved. It also identifies faulted or damaged sensors. It's easily you can find the location 
and it also timestamps the issue. The automatic device configuration, when you need to replace a sensor because it's damaged or it just went bad, um, you can replace the sensor's configuration, setup, and profiles. They all automatically download to the new sensor, so you don't have to futz with any uh, teach button or anything like that. So it's a true plug and play. And the add-on profiles, um, when you use an add-on profile and you download them, it pre-populates descriptive tags and has pre-engineered faceplates. And when you install multiple sensor profiles, that allows for fast product changeover. And what I mean by um, profiles is you can uh, store multiple uh, set points, targets, and things of that nature into the sensor. So if you're running bottles with red labels now and you need to switch over to the blue label bottle, you can do that with a press of a button, once again, when you're using IO Link, and it will set up automatically, it allows for the very quick changeover, and it reduces scrap. So this is just a snapshot of, oops, can we go back? This is just a snapshot of the IO Link sensor integration. And up at the top, you'll see your HMI, you'll see your uh, Logix control, your Ethernet switch, and your uh, point IO modules. On the bottom, towards the bottom, you'll see four sensors on the left. And that little right side up and upside down V is the IO Link um, little icon. So those four sensors are automatically IO link capable. So when you hook them into your uh, Flex IO, which is an IO link module, it's automatically ready to go right into your Ethernet, into your PLC. The next grouping of discrete IO, you'll see a couple proxies there, a stack light, limit switch, and a push button. Those are discrete IO. So they're going to go into an IO link hub. So those will go, which the IO Link Hub is IO Link capable, even though it's using discrete sensors, and it can go right into your Flex IO also, which goes into your Ethernet. The next grouping of five sensors there, they're all IO Link ready, and those are being connected into an Armor Block IO module. And uh, lastly, the discrete IO, again, there's five, uh, five devices, they're into an IO Link. Um, uh, hub, and those will, can automatically go into your, if you're using an on machine armor block, it can be wired into the armor block, which goes through your Ethernet. It's just a little description there. The 855T to 856T stack light migration. The 855Ts were obsoleted in July 2019. The 856T is a more modern looking design. It has a lot new features. Um, it's, you can stack them seven levels high. It's a broad range of mounting options. You can also use a non-stackable beacon for very small, you know, one light applications that's quick and easy to set up. And the um, 856T has fewer uh, part numbers. So the 856T is also 70 millimeters in diameter. It offers a brighter LED options, reduced number of part, part numbers. There's multifunctional light modules that can be configured via dip switches. It has a red, green, and blue multicolor LED module that you can configure seven colors. There's also rotation light modules that you can rotate six different colors. And the multi-tone sound modules also have recordable capabilities. This is just a little snapshot of how to assemble an 856T system. On the bottom, um, you'll select your base. So that will be maybe your surface mount or vertical mount adapter or pole mount. Uh, then you'll select your power module, which you, which you didn't need to do before because your lights were the power, or the base was the power module. But this time, you have to select your power module, so AC or 24 volt DC. Next will be your light or sounders. Now, so your lights um, stacked as usual. Now we offer an inline sounder. So in the middle of the stack, you can have a sound module. 
And then lastly would be your top uh, device, which would be a sound module, maybe one of those uh, smart looking beacons, and uh, also your cap if you're just using a standard light module. So advantages, um, the ability to indicate more conditions because you have seven circuits now. It's easy to get reduced numbers of components because now we have multifunction, multi-channel type of light and sound modules. It's also quicker to install because the 856Ts have, uh, they wire through the push-in terminal blocks, which makes life a lot easier for everyone. And it's also available with an N12 quick disconnect base and it's IP6667. Just some helpful links that I've included. I have the IO-Link technology landing page, which also gives you links to all the IO-Link sensors, the 856T landing page, the 856T migration brochure, but the document that I like the best is the 856T technical document. It's a technical document for all the signaling devices, but um, sometimes, and I know I've helped um, our inside or outside people cross 855T parts to 856T, and sometimes you get a weird configuration. You can easily look it up on this document for the 855T and literally turn one page and you, start, you can look at your 856T equivalent. So I find that document very, very helpful. So um, that's all I have today, and I can open it up to any questions you may have. All right, and Donna, while we do that, I will turn over control to Joe LaMonica. Any questions from anyone? All right, well, with that, Joe, hopefully uh, you're able to take over. Are you there? Yep, I'm here. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Donna. And Joe, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Let's see here. All right. I think it's working here. Here we go. Okay. So uh, first one we're going to deal with is overload. So here's just a, uh, a snapshot of the overload portfolio. Um, the E300 you see on, on the top, that was released several years ago. It's a good, very powerful overload relay. The E200 was released last year. And then just recently, the E100 um, was just released. And that's the migration that we'll be looking at. So on here is just a snapshot of the different features that come with these overloads. And you can just see, again, the E300 being the most powerful all the way down to your uh, E100 by Metallic. <clears throat> so just real quick on the E200, um, just wanted to mention this since it's relatively new. So this has just about as powerful as the E300, but this is for a non-networked application. Um, if you wanted to gain access to all of the uh, parameters and configurations, you would um, configure this in connected components software. If you were just using a relatively basic application overload, then you have dip switches on the front that you can use to configure it um, and then the rotary dials to set the FLA. So this is also backwards compatible to the other E300 module. So if you have an E300 in there and for whatever reason you want it to go to a non-networked overload, you would take off that communication module and put this one on it. Okay, so the migration here, the E1 Plus, which has been around for a long time, you can see there over 18 years, that will be discontinued next year, 2021, where you will not be able to purchase it anymore. And we are going to be migrating to the E100. So E100 is now available. Uh, the E1 Plus is going away. The microprocessors that they use inside of it are no longer available. Um, so don't have much of a choice but to go into obsolescence with this. And they're advertising planning to be discontinued in April 2021, but um, it could potentially be earlier than that because of last time buys. Being that this is such a common overload relay and um, 
we move these by the boatload, it could potentially be earlier than that. So we have some time, but not something to sit around and wait on. So the E100, <clears throat> there's two models on this, a basic and advanced. So the basic unit goes up to 100 amps. That's a direct mount onto your contactor. You can have a 10, 20 amp, 10 or 20 trip class on it. It's got a manual reset and then some uh, accessories to go with that. And then the advanced model can go up to 800 amps using CTs. And your trip class could be 10, 15, 20, or 30. And that can be automatic or manual reset. And that has um, more accessories available to be used with that. Now, uh, good news is that the E100 is the identical size to the E1 Plus, um, so no issues there. And you can just see here on the right what it, what it looks like with the rotary dials. It looks very similar to the E1 Plus. Um, not a whole lot has changed as far as that goes. And this unit, the basic and advanced, can be used in single phase and three phase, where the E1 Plus there was one unit for single phase, and then it was a separate part number for three phase. This one, you can have it all in one. Here's just a snapshot of the catalog. So you see your catalog structure there building out a part number for the E100, and then the uh, accessories to go with that, your tamper shield, um, adapter, ground, fault, or jam protection. Um, and then there's also a electronic remote display that you could mount on your panel and you could see the status of the overload. Um, you could remotely reset it through that or and it has a warning light. If maybe you're getting close to the overload tripping, it can give you that indication as well. <clears throat> and here's some documentation that will be sent out with the migration manual, things like that. The next product here would be the SMC50. So here's uh, an overview of the complete line. The SMC3 and the SMC Flex have been around for a long time, good, consistent products. The SMC50, uh, the solid state power structure was released several years ago. And just um, within the last year or so, the SMC50, the uh, hybrid power structure was released. So when we say a hybrid power structure, there's SCRs in that unit uh, to do the ramp up. And then once it gets to full speed, there's a contactor that sits inside of there and it automatically switches over to the contactor. <clears throat> so now that the hybrid power structure is available, um, you can migrate from the SMC Flex to the SMC 50. So the SMC Flex, um, there is no published discontinued date yet. Um, but eventually it's in the works and it will happen. So right now, frames three, four, and five um, can be migrated over to the SMC50, which is amperage ratings of 108 to 480 amperage rating. And why would you want to do that for the SMC50? Well, there's more starting and stopping modes. It has more I.O. capabilities. It has advanced diagnostics. And then two key features that I'm going to talk a little bit about is device logics and then the advanced energy uh, metering. And you see here on the right, this chart just gives you a breakdown of all the options that come standard with it um, or that are optional. The SMC Flex, I'll just point out, to get certain starting and stopping modes, it had a different control module for the pump control or smart motor braking where everything comes standard in the SMC50 and it just has one control module. <clears throat> so device logic, so what is device logic? Well, it's basically a mini PLC that gets put inside of the SMC50 and gives you some control options now. Um, this sets the SMC50 apart from every other soft start, not just the Flex, but anything else that's out on the market. Nobody else can do this. And it can be handy if you have an application where you've got a remote pump or motor somewhere um, and you need some control options where maybe you don't want to edit the main PLC program. And this gives you the flexibility to do that. You see the example here. Maybe you have four uh, pumps that you want to start in sync with each other. 
you've got a 25 second delay and with some simple programming and a delay timer there you can do that and you're not getting into the main PLC program. Uh, another benefit is if you are controlling the SMC50 over your network and the network goes down you can have device logics to bring the SMC down um, to a controlled stop or you can run it in a manual mode. Um, so some good features there that can be helpful. And the other capability has is this advanced uh, power metering. So a uh, little fun fact, 65% of energy consumption in industry is consumed by the electric motor and that's a pretty big number and we've seen um, we've seen some folks become conscious of this and make some uh, steps to cut down on their energy consumption but the SMC 50 gives you some capability to monitor that and see where you're using energy how much you're using where peak demands are and things like that um, and on top of the power metering it also does um, THD which is total harmonic distortion which can pick up transients and noise and anything that can cause some issues uh, for the soft start and motor and stuff. So I think with those two uh, features there that really sets the SMC50 apart from other soft starts. And here are a couple different ways you can get your hands on SMC50. You can get it standalone, put it in your own panel. You can get it enclosed where um, the factory will build that out for you and it, it's highly configurable. They will put all kinds of stuff in that enclosure and you, you can whatever spec you want to put in there whatever options and different products they will build it to your spec you can get it in a motor control center and then they've also released upgrade kits and this is only for frame three and four but if you currently have an SMC flex installed you can take off the SMC flex control module purchase an upgrade kit which is the SMC 50 control module with a few other things in there it plugs on to the SMC Flex power structure, and now you have all the capabilities of an SMC 50, So, um, which is a neat thing instead of swapping out the entire soft start. And here's some links for documents, migration, user manual, tech data, things like that. And the last product for me is the 931 uh, signal conditioners. So the 931H, high density, the S standard, and the U for universal. All of those were obsoleted in 2019, December. And the 931 Nano and the 931 Smart um, has been available for a few months now. And where would you see these being used? Um, you know, common applications, measurement devices, temperature, pressure, level, flow, um, speed, frequency, weight, um, that's where you would typically see these products being used. So some features for the Nano and the Smart. The Nano is six millimeters in width, so it's very thin and you can stack up a whole bunch of them, not take up too much panel space. They're configured with the dip switch. They are very um, accurate, 0.05% in taking a signal and uh, moving that signal on, whether it's isolating and converting it. Uh, there's some status LEDs and it's um, has a uh, hazardous location rating and then the smart 931 smart units some of those devices have a universal input where it could be um, an analog could be a voltage could be milliamp could be RTD thermocouple and you can actually program that unit um, to have different inputs and if you wanted to standardize on just one of these units you could use it in multiple applications with the universal input it has a very fast response time half a millisecond Error detection, so if there's some issue with that sensor, some fault, this unit will pick it up and try to communicate that through these status LEDs. They also have heart communication uh, capabilities, and some of these are software configurable with those universal inputs and some different uh, features you can pro program in there. And the last thing is this power bus DIN system. So you see these um, mount onto a DIN rail. And some of these are loop powered, some are not, but you would have to bring power to that unit one way or another. If you are using several of these, it might make sense to use this power bus here. It actually mounts inside of the DIN rail. And then when these units get mounted onto the DIN rail, it makes connection to that power bus. And you can power up to 75 modules if you're using a lot of them. So 
Uh, I think that is the last for me. And you've got some links here on the 931s. And uh, if no questions, we'll uh, hand it off to Will. All right. So we'll we'll open it up to if there are any questions as we move this over to Will. All right. I guess with that, Will, if uh, if you can take over, go for it. Yep. Hey, everyone. So my name is Will Howley. I am an IC specialist with Rumsey. I've been with Rumsey for about five years, and uh, today I have three products that I'm going to go over, similar to my coworkers. The first of which is the 1694 electronic circuit protector. For those who aren't familiar, I guess I'll just briefly touch on what an electronic circuit protector is. They're also called ECPs. Uh, and essentially, they go on the secondary of the power supply and protect individual loads, specifically 24-volt DC circuits. And there are a few key advantages of this new one that Rockwell has on the right. So typically, people are going to use mini circuit breakers, whether they're a UL1077 or a UL489 breaker, uh, to protect loads on the secondary. But those are designed for AC circuits, whether you're using a, a breaker or a fuse. Sorry, I was just told my volume was a bit low, so hopefully you guys can hear me a little bit better now. Yeah, you sound okay, Well. Okay. So if you're using a, a mini circuit breaker or, or a fuse, there are certain characteristics that make them more suited for AC loads, whereas a DC... Uh, electronic circuit protector is more suited and we can get really granular with the trip curves and the the way that the time and current look on on the graph uh, when you actually read the the characteristics there but that's not the intention of this of this presentation essentially we just kind of want to give a, a relatively brief overview and, and kind of touch on some of the differences uh, additionally Rockwell has had previous electronic circuit protectors, which are still available. Uh, in the bottom left there, you see the, the bulletin is 1692, um, and that is a block style, meaning that it is not modular. It has four circuits, and you have to pay for all four, essentially, whereas with the new one, you can basically pay for what you want. So the components that comprise a 1694 system are the power feed module, which can go up to 40 amps, the individual protection modules, which you can have up to four per power feed module, and they have six amp ratings up to 10 amps. And then you have distribution modules, which will then distribute power to the individual loads. Now, as you can see on that picture, there are they're not lit up right there, but there are visual indicators that will show the status of each load. When they are running normally, they will be green. When they get to 90% load, they will turn amber. And when the load has tripped, they will turn red. Here's kind of an example circuit of how this would be used so you can kind of visualize. Uh, so essentially you have your circuit breaker on the line side of the power supply, and then you have your electronic circuit protector on the secondary. You have some, uh, some proc sensors there connected, and each one of those proxes would take up uh, one, of the, one of the protection modules. And you can also run an aux back to a PLC to get your status indication on the ECP. So just to uh, kind of wrap up what we just went over, there are a handful of key benefits of using this type of technology. Uh, one is that it is it can double as a class two power source. So if you have, uh, whether it's a PLC, a networking switch, a sensor, or something like that that requires class two power or limited power, uh, it's, it's 100 watts or under, and typically you would need a, a second power supply that is rated for class two. These ha have the ability to 
provide class two power, which could in many cases uh, reduce your need to buy a separate power supply. Additionally, they provide that LED indication that I went over. And they protect and disconnect individual loads without taking out, you know, all of the loads that would be connected to a power supply. And obviously they are, they are a modular product. And, and that enhanced tripping technology that, that I briefly touched on. Um, so one of the cool things that Rockwell put together on their website for this product is an interactive demo which uh, actually shows the time current curves of A1694 versus a many circuit breakers, so whether you're looking at uh, a Z curve, a, a B curve, a C curve, or even a D curve, you can see that uh, on a short circuit, it is detecting it much faster than uh, a, a mini circuit breaker would. We have 0.01 second on the 1694 versus 10, 15, or 16 seconds. Um, and, and similar for an overload, whereas with a a C curve breaker, which is for more inductive loads, it may take up to eight minutes and 20 seconds to trip. The, uh, the ECP is tripping in three seconds. And uh, if, if we want to, if anyone's interested, just let me know and I, I can kind of give you a much more detailed explanation of what that is and how that could be of benefit to you. And here are just a few links that that go over some of the things that we talked about today. The next product to go over are the 450L series light curtains. So uh, historically Rockwell has offered the 445L light curtains and they are in the process of and have been transitioning to the 450L series. Uh, so not all 445L series are going away, but a, a good bit of them are, and they are they are migrating to the 450L. So the 450L has two models. Uh, there's a 450LB, which is basic, and a 450LE, which is enhanced. So essentially, it's another situation where you can uh, you can get you can pay for what you want, and, and there aren't you're, you're not paying for features that you don't want or need. primary difference between the uh, the enhanced and the basic versions being that the basic really just does basic on-off functions and the enhanced uh, can do more advanced things like blanking, muting, cascading. Um, you can send information back to uh, over Ethernet through software. So uh, a key technology change here is what they call transceiver technology, meaning that you buy two identical sticks and you insert a dip switch that will tell the switch whether it's a transmitter or a receiver. So if you had, uh, you know, just a, a standard light curtain, you would buy two identical sticks, and you would buy one of the transmitter dip switches and one of the receiver dip switches, and you would insert them into the individual stick and then set the dip switches so that the stick knew how it was supposed to act. Additionally, there are universal modules if you wanted to standardize on a single part number. And here are just some more uh, some more key features that are on the new the new module. Um, one of the cool things is that there's no dead space on the 450L. Uh, some of our competitors at the bottom or the top, there may be a, a portion where there are no beams. And as you can see on this picture, the beams go all the way down to the bottom, which could allow you to, you know, use a smaller product or get uh, essentially more safety out of what you buy. So just uh, here again, we have a few key summarizing benefits. Obviously, the modularity, the reduced inventory, and the ability to monitor and remote troubleshoot through software. These are able to achieve the highest performance level, uh, PLE. And, and once again, there's no dead space. As of right now, the 445L, as I stated, not all of them, but the 
a good bit of them are planned to be obsoleted in October of this year. So we still have a little bit of time, but if this is a situation where maybe someone's interested or has a customer that's interested, please let us know sooner rather than later so that we can give you the relevant information or, or maybe even send you a demo to test out. And here are just a, another handful of links that when you guys get the copy of these slides, you'll be able to, to go over. And the third and final topic that I'll be covering today is the migration of a number of safety relays. So uh, a common misconception when people hear this is that the MSR series is going away, which uh, is not true. The MSR 127 series specifically, which uh, is a very popular safety relay, is not being obsoleted. There are just a number of single function relays that are being obsoleted and migrated to the new series, which is the GSR family. So once again, simply put, the, the GSR relays are, are better suited for the future. They meet all of the latest safety standards. So whether you're looking at uh, something like ISO 13849 um, or you know, an IEC standard, these are the ones to, to use going forward. They're standardized on, and you can see them on the right there. You can, they're modular and you can gang them together. Uh, they're all 22 and a half millimeters in width. And uh, they, they have the ability to connect over ethernet on the back plane with something called an optical bus. And then on the left of that picture, there's a white module and that's the ethernet module so that you could connect these and, and bring that data up to a PLC. But essentially, it's, they're performing the same basic logic functions as an MSR relay. Um, one of the, the cool things that the GSR have, and these have been out for a number of years, but they continue to expand the family, is something called single wire safety, which is uh, a unique safety rated signal sent to monitor and indicate status. Um, and, and the diagnostics that you achieve through that monitoring allow you to achieve the highest safety ratings. So Rockwell spent a good bit of time putting together documentation to help with this transition. So they have profiles and they also have uh, detailed transition documents. So here are just kind of some snapshots that show what you can get out of those. And they will tell you, you know, whether it's if the old version was 120 volts and the new version is 24, they will give you the dimensions of not only a a new safety relay that would work for you, but also a power supply. And typically the way that they designed these was that, so if your original relay was 45 millimeters wide, you could use a 22 and a half millimeter safety relay and then a 22 and a half millimeter power supply and they would take up the same space in a panel. And they'll also give you uh, detailed wiring diagrams to show any differences there. So uh, overall they've, they've put in a good bit of effort to make this as smooth of a transition as possible. And finally, just introduced one more new product, which is uh, the MSR55 feedback EMF relay. So Rockwell originally had a product called the CU2, uh, which was a single function relay. Um, and essentially what these do is they monitor the standstill of a motor. Uh, so when you turn off, when you disconnect a motor, there's going to be some, some remnant voltage that comes through. Um, and we want to be able to you know, prevent any uh, excess rotation of the motor from creating a potentially hazardous scenario. So the MSR55P are similar to the previous relays, uh, capable of achieving the highest safety readings, whether it's PLE or SIL3 that you're looking at. And they do that without using a proc sensor or an encoder. It's just with this relay. They're available in 24 volt, 120, or 240 volt AC. And, and essentially what they're doing is when the motor gets to a safe level or stops, it'll send a signal to a guard locking switch to open the door. And it's, it's monitoring voltage between phases as it winds down the speed. So the CU2 is going to be discontinued in 12 months. And the 
the MSR55 on the right there is what is taking its place and also offering a handful of advantages. You can see just a, a basic schematic of how this looks. You've got the MSR55P monitoring the motor and then sending a signal to, in that situation, a, a solid state guard locking switch. Saying that it's okay to open the door and it's, uh, it's releasing the lock. Uh, once again, here are just some documents that you guys will have access to. Uh, and at the top there, I just want to remind people, uh, you may be aware, but Rockwell puts a significant amount of time and effort into developing safety functions, which are essentially pre-engineered documents that, that go over a specific safety function, and they can be used as a basis for design. And those safety functions really come in handy, whether you have one that is specifically suited to your application or if it just kind of gets you in the ballpark and maybe sometimes we even may use two separate safety functions and kind of splice them together to give you an idea of what you would use in your application. I guess we'll hang on here for a second to see if there's any questions. All right, yeah. I think that's all I have. All right. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Well, that, that was great. Um, yeah, I will reiterate that that safety functions website, I know every time I have the, the option to talk about it, I do point people towards it, uh, especially because I had learned something a few years ago where you can embed an awful lot of AutoCAD and basic uh, programs and everything else right into an Adobe file, and a lot of those files that you can download from there have a lot of that basic information uh, for a good place for you to start from. The only other comment that I guess I, I will uh, throw out here for everyone. Uh, Joe touched on it a little bit in the soft start section with device logics. Uh, Will mentioned it here a little bit as far as the uh, light curtains and, and having the ability to do software connected to them. Um, the reference to all of that stuff is Connected Components Workbench. So for anybody that's, uh, you know, familiar with it primarily from, you know, the initial launch of using it for like the Micrologics 800 or yeah, the, the Micro 800 product line. Um, Rockwell's really enveloping a lot of products into using CCW as kind of its basis for program. So, you know, both of, uh, you know, here on this call, we're talking about the light curtains and device logics and the SMC, uh, but all of the drive specialists at Rumsey use CCW for all of the PowerFlex drives on top of that. And then obviously the Micro 800, as well as the um, Panaview, uh, uh, Panaview 800. So um, just as a general reference of software and support, that uh, that package of software is something you can download for free, and it does connect to a lot of Rockwell's products to help you configure them and and put them together uh, very quickly. Uh, so just as a as a side note to all the industrial controls, where that software package fits in. So with that, any overall questions? All right. Well, with that, I would uh, like to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, we are going to continue these locked-in sessions from uh, every Tuesday and Thursday through the month of May. I fully expect that we'll continue some version of this uh, going into June and July, but probably at a little less frequent. Uh, I believe it'll be every Tuesday. Um, but uh, with that, um, if you have any questions, you have all of our contact information and feel free to, uh, to reach out to us. Thank you everyone for attending.